Welcome to tonight's uh, New Horizons, the Cerebral Palsy Town Hall series. This evening, we are going to be joined by the teams from Chicago, from Shelley Ryan Ability Lab, as well as Northwestern University. This evening's um, panel is going to really be looking at how we can provide families with the best evidence and practical guidance to optimise muscle function and performance in children with cerebral palsy. And we'll also be looking at how spasticity um, affects both motor function as well as performance. And we'll, this evening particularly, we would love for you to make sure that you put your questions in the comment section. The comment section can just be found on the right-hand side of the video. And please, as we go, put in any questions that you have uh, for our speakers this evening. Uh, this panel is actually going to be broken up into two different sections. The first being our expert panel, and the second being a family panel. So we are really looking forward to bringing you all of this information this evening. I would also like to say um, thank you to Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals, who is the sponsor of our town hall series. Now, first up uh, this evening, we are going to have Dr. Deborah Gablespira. Uh, she is a, a professor in pediatric physical uh, medicine rehabilitation. And we are so fortunate to have her um, speaking with us this evening. We are also going to have uh, Dr. Sudarshan Dayandi, who is a researcher and a scientist um, and a physical therapist. We will then have uh, Cara O'Malley, who is a paediatric physical therapist, and Theresa Moulton, who is also a paediatric physical therapist. And we are so excited for this panel. And then for our family panel, we are going to be joined by the Johnson family. So to get started, I would like to welcome Dr. Deborah Gablespira. Good evening, and thanks for attending the virtual town hall meeting. I wish we could be in person, but this is the way we are uh, performing all of our functions these days. Um, I, it's my good fortune to work in a team that includes um, not only um, physicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists, but we also include the families. So uh, we are going to be talking about how science includes families and uh, in particular, we'll be focusing on muscle. Just to get us on the same page, um, cerebral palsy is a group of disorders um, and disturbances of movement and postures. Uh, which means that the children will have difficulty moving. It's attributed or it's said to be caused by a non-progressive or static or an unchanging injury or abnormality to a developing brain. Um, it also has to impact activities uh, and a, it can be uh, uh, accompanied by sensory abnormalities um, issues of behavior, cognition, but not always, epilepsy. And for the, the, the reason we frequently see children at Shirley Ryan is for the musculoskeletal issues. Now, cerebral palsy has been known for many, many centuries, but this is a current definition. How this changes the perspective is that this creates an emphasis on activities and not just on impairments. A lot of people will think about cerebral palsy as the brain injury, but really it's a performance issue. Um, it creates an inclusion of other issues that can affect um, performance, and um, it attributes some of the comorbidities for prognosis. Um, CP is a diagnosis um, that is caused by many uh, conditions uh, and uh, many reasons, there can be many reasons for the brain injury. So this is why um, there's never two children with CP that look exactly the same. 
Um, the way we organize in rehabilitation is that we look at certain paradigms of outcomes. And this is known as the World Health Organization's International Classification of, and, of Function. Uh, we're very fortunate that we have all aspects represented tonight, body structure and function. This is what's happening at the tissue or at the muscle level. Activities are those things that uh, create uh, the mobility, self-care, speaking, and then participation are those activities that are meaningful to the child and meaningful to everyone uh, to be able to do. It's also modified by the personal factors and the external environment. And uh, we're really happy that we've got the personal factors represented tonight as well. So you want to know how do you create a team of people for cere to, to work in the context of cerebral palsy. It's like building a snow person. Uh, you have uh, the center of the, the snowman is the parent and child. Uh, generally, all children have a pediatrician, and so they, be, they determine if there is a delay in movement Frequently that initiates early intervention and early intervention will start with a physical therapy, any other therapies and care coordination. This allows the family to begin the process of looking to set goals and how to um, map the future. Frequently at this point, physical medicine and rehabilitation or pediatric rehab is involved because we're also advising and will be that longitudinal trajectory for children through their lifespan. Early intervention, since it, it uh, terminates at three, there's generally a handoff then to the school system. Because cerebral palsy has all those other possible conditions, it's really important to add on the medical specialties that are going to enhance outcome. And the first really rehab goal is medical stability. So frequently you'll be um, involved with a pediatric neurologist to determine the etiology or the reason for the injury. And that will put some definition around it, as well as pediatric orthopedics, which will begin the process of looking at the alignment in the bone. Um, very important is that uh, there can be some sensory abnormalities, so ophthalmology, hearing, everything has to be medically managed beautifully. If you think about a pediatric practice, um, if you have a thousand children in your pediatric as a pediatrician, you'll only have two to four children with cerebral palsy. Whereas a pediatric physiatrist, if they have a, a population of a thousand, 600 of those to 700 will have cerebral palsy. So it's very frequent that a pediatric rehab specialist will have a lot of contact and knowledge about who are the specialists to be involved with. Um, nursing is extremely important in this early um, age group because they are the glue and it's very important to know who to call in any system. As the children move into the next phase of school, you add on the school, the educators, psychologists, and importantly, it's at this time where you develop autonomy. So we're looking um, at uh, the school-age children to develop the adaptive sports or recreation and to begin even thinking about vocational efforts. It's never too soon to think about getting a job. As, and it's always better to uh, get into that process of thinking about that early versus late. Of course, then in the teenage years, the, you really expand your horizons and transition into the adult world as well. We're very fortunate, Shirley Ryan, we have the um, extension into the adult physiatrist, so we have the ability to follow children from very young to the older ages. Um, and a, a person who is not in the, the clinic room at any one time, but is always on my mind, is the jewel in the crown at Shirley Ryan, which is the researchers. The researchers are involved in every aspect of the, um, the, the from early diagnosis to musculoskeletal to transition. And so we're, we're very fortunate to have research tonight to come and talk about some of the, the exciting things that have been going on at Shirley Ryan in muscle. 
Um, this is a, a shot of our beautiful uh, gym. And you can see we have robotics, we have early mobility, we've got a lot of nice light and beautiful surrounding. Uh, and welcome anyone to come and visit with us. Next. Uh, this is uh, sort of our tentative agenda for you so that you can walk away with understanding what is muscle, gain some knowledge about uh, the evidence behind the, the strengthening endurance and flexibility. We're very fortunate to then get a personal perspective. And I can say that that um, Lark and her family have been participating at all levels of our um, opportunities. And um, we, we certainly want to give some practical uh, suggestions about how to accomplish um, the goals of therapy. Next. Um, we talked about in the beginning about uh, the cause of cerebral palsy is an is, uh, a injury to the brain. Um, and there is a lot of emphasis about neuroplasticity. Um, however, we're going to change the direction and talk about uh, one of the most malleable and adaptable um, tissues in the body, which is muscle. And uh, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the real muscle man in the crowd, who is Dr. Sudarshan Dayendi. Um, Sudarshan is a physical therapist. He has extensive experience in um, motion analysis, and he is uh, currently working on a lot of very interesting muscle um, uh, studies for us. So please take it away, Sudarshan. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about muscles. All of us think of skeletal muscles, think of things that we do with muscles. But I'd like to talk a little bit about what do scientists think about when they talk about muscles. So when we consider muscles, all muscles in our body, our skeletal muscles in our body are made up of similar structures. They might be slightly different in their size. They might be slightly different in their length in terms of the way they're oriented, things like that. But overall, all muscles are highly organized within each muscle you have a lot of these muscle bundles or muscle fascicles surrounded by connective tissue. And within each of those bundles, you have a lot of these um, muscle cells or myofibers. And when we think of a muscle contracting, we typically are talking about these um, muscle fibers or myofibers contracting. And when we talk about contraction, what we actually are talking about are these uh, molecular motors which exist within each of those myofibers, which are the sarcomeres. And these molecular motors, we have millions of them within each of the muscles. They are at the, they're proteins that interact with each other to be able to create force. So they use a lot of energy to be able to do this. But when we talk about muscle contraction, we're talking about what are the sarcomeres actually doing in terms of the way they are interacting to be able to generate force. And that's a force that lets us uh, do all to move and do all the things that we do uh, in this world, and similarly for other mammals. And when we think about postnatal development, broadly speaking, uh, what happens is that these uh, muscle cells are increasing in length and they're becoming bigger in size. And so they're adding more of those sarcomeres or more molecular motors to be able to generate more force and to be able to allow for the muscles to uh, have complete excursion at our joints. In kids with cerebral palsy, in many situations, this uh, growth along the length, as well as in terms of girth is uh, affected, meaning that if they're not able to increase uh, the size of those uh, myofibers, those myofibers are, or muscle cells are smaller and consequently weaker. And if they're not able to uh, add more proteins along the length of the fiber, then the fiber uh, prevents the muscle from being able to do a complete excursion at the joint. And uh, secondary to this, we, uh, in, in many children, we see uh, what we call muscle contractures, meaning that the muscles are, that the uh, muscles are not growing properly. And due to the improper growth of the muscle, uh, kids are, uh, walking with their hips and uh, knees in flexion, or they're walking on their toes. Um, and th these uh, kinds of situations uh, 
uh, are potentially related to impaired muscle growth combined with other factors such as spasticity. Now, when we talk about muscle growth in general, what exactly are we talking about in terms of cells? Because we, there are, our body is essentially made up of lots and lots of different tissues made up from different kinds of uh, stem cells. So everybody has heard of stem cells. You have all kinds of different stem cells. You, can, you have mesenchymal stem cells, you have neural stem cells, you have hematopoietic stem cells. All of these stem cells create certain kinds of uh, cells and they also maintain themselves, meaning that they have they maintain this capacity to be able to create more cells. So for example, if you consider hematopoietic stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells are responsible for creating all the different uh, cells we have within our blood. And let's say you go and donate some blood, you're able to replenish that uh, blood that you donated thanks to uh, these cells which exist within our uh, body. And when we talk about muscle, we have a different kind of cells within the muscle. So most people have a intuitive understanding that muscles are very plastic. Muscles are able to increase in force or increase in size. Muscles are able to train to be able to do all kinds of heroic activities like triathlons and marathons and all kinds of other things that human beings have been doing forever. Now, when we talk about uh, the satellite cells, which are our muscle stem cells, these are called satellite cells because they hang around in the periphery of those um, myofibers or muscle cells. And um, they were first discovered in 1961 by Alexander Morrow. And I guess that was the space age of exploration. So he thought that they're like satellites, they're hovering around the myofiber. And hence he called them satellite cells. Now, there, to understand how these cells work, um, let's think about what happens with a situation that most of us are familiar with in one way or the other, which is that let's say that, you know, unfortunately due, due to this pandemic uh, or due to a Chicago winter, you're stuck at home for a long while. And then it's a beautiful spring day and it's 70 degrees and you go out for a, a short run and then you get excited and you just keep running for five miles or something and then it's a great run and you come home and life is good again and then uh two days later your muscles start complaining they're uh they're painful they're, every time you sit stand everything is always this is constantly hurting and at a couple of days later those muscles recover perfectly fine so and then you it, it seems like you that nothing happened at all. So the way that happens is because of these cells. So typically these satellite cells are uh, uh, sitting around quiescently, meaning that they're not doing anything, they're just chilling. And then when we have a situation such as uh, an unexpected uh, long run, which caused all kinds of micro tears within the muscle, these cells will detect those uh, signals from it and they'll get activated. They will increase in number. They will fuse and they will go to the regions in the muscle which need to be repaired and they will fuse with that and repair those particular aspects of the muscle. And this, a similar thing happens during um, muscle postnatal development is that uh, these cells are responsible for postnatal development. So let's imagine the muscle is growing, the bone is applying stretch on the muscle. When the bone applies stretch on the muscle, the muscle responds by activating these cells and uh, the cells will increase in number, they will uh, fuse with each other and they will create more muscle material, which will go and combine with the existing part of the, the myofiber and increase it in uh, girth as well as increase it in length. So scientists here at Shalira and Ability Lab, uh, as well as other scientists across the world are interested in uh, trying to understand what happens to these cells in children with cerebral palsy. And secondly, trying to understand uh, how exactly can we use the uh, regenerative capacity of these cells to be able to increase the capacity for muscle growth uh, in children with cerebral palsy? And as you can imagine, this is hard to do uh, because we are not able to understand what's happening within these cells unless we get a biopsy from kids. And typically, we get uh, we are only able to get a biopsy from kids when they're undergoing surgery. And so we uh, support this, these, this understanding by doing experiments in 
uh, mice, which are special mice in the sense that their genetics have been changed, so we can actually treat them with a drug to be able to get rid of those satellite cells. And then uh, we try to see how that uh, ch changes the way they respond. So for example, if you think about, uh, if any of you have had a fracture and you had your arm or leg in a cast, you know that when the cast comes off, your muscles have become smaller. But then after a couple of months, your muscles are back to normal, your muscles are strong, you can do whatever you were able to do earlier. So that, that process of atrophy or making the muscles smaller and then letting and allowing the muscles to grow back, that's sort of what we are trying to study here by using this uh, cast on our mice to create that atrophy. And then we try to understand what's the role of satellite cells and how that muscle will regrow. And similarly, we also are uh, using these models or these mice to be able to make them run on a treadmill to get them to do exercise and then see how that exercise might be altered or different if they don't have the satellite cells that I was telling you about. And then finally, I want to talk to you about another uh, component which is very important uh, within muscle. And this is one you all, everybody knows about, and that's mitochondria. So mitochondria, every high school student or Everybody has at some point in their lives heard uh, this thing that, oh yeah, mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. And the mitochondria exists in all, all our cells across the body, not just muscle. And, but within muscle, there are a large number of mitochondria. Because if you remember, I said that the sarcomeres, the molecular motors, every time they're contracting, they are using a lot of energy. So pretty much all the food that we eat, whether it's uh, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, they all get broken down within the mitochondria. Similarly, the oxygen that we are breathing, it trickles down within into the mitochondria. And the mitochondria have these really cool uh, evolutionary structures that we are essentially using to create energy. But what those uh, structures are doing or what those protein complexes are doing is that they are taking the food that we are eating and the oxygen that we are breathing to create a, a sort of a, a battery or a charge, if you will. And using the charge, they're able to uh, create energy. And um, as you can imagine, if you need a lot of energy, you need a lot of mitochondria. And so um, a lot of us, when we train for events, uh, we, we sort of like, let's say we're training for a marathon or a half marathon, or we start running more these mitochondria will increase in number. And that's sort of what allows us to be able to go from being couch potatoes to being marathon runners. And uh, the, these are very important organelles within muscle to be able to generate energy. And if these uh, mitochondria are not able to keep up with the energy demand or are not able to create energy efficiently, then that is going to lead to problems with our ability to be able to move uh, without using a lot of energy. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Wonderful, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Dr. O'Malley and I are delighted to take our mitochondria to the big stage and think about what happens in humans as we exercise and thinking about specifically intensity and frequency of exercise. That is how hard do you exercise and how often do you exercise? So we're going to start with the first slide is the most complicated slide we're going to show you tonight. This model is basically a lot of the things that we think of as physical therapists when we're deciding how to best treat somebody with cerebral palsy. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the muscle and how we make impacts on that. And dose of exercise is one of the ways that we have a direct impact. And Kara and I just want to point out the importance of family here because the family is going to have a direct impact on the dose that is received as well as the community context. Next slide, please. So we kind of want to build on what Sudarshan was uh, discussing and talk about some different ways that you might hear your therapist describe muscle. Um, so some of those words might be strength, power, length, and endurance. Basically, strength refers to how strong are you? Can you pick up 10 pounds or can you pick up 20 pounds? Power has a little bit more to do with how quickly 
um, you can do that movement. So it's both strength and speed. So can you pick up 10 pounds in five seconds or do you have a little bit more power and can pick up 10 pounds in one or two seconds? As Sudarshan mentioned, when we talk about muscle length, we're really looking at how long a muscle is from the beginning to the end. And the way that we measure that is by looking at how far our joints can move. So is our elbow stuck a little bit in a bent position or can it get all the way straight? And then finally looking at endurance of our muscles. So can our muscles work for a prolonged period of time? Oftentimes we might think, can we run for five minutes or can we run for a half hour? Or going back to the 10 pound idea, can we pick up 10 pounds three times or can we pick up 10 pounds 15 or 20 times? And that's looking at the endurance of the muscle. So the next slide, we're going to specifically look at muscle strength and muscle power. So how much can we pick up and how quickly can we do that, if you want to think about it that way. When we think about muscle strength and power, oftentimes what we're thinking about is resistance training or weight training. That might be the words that you're more used to hearing. There's been a lot of studies looking at strength and power training in children without CP. And these have consistently shown that it's it's safe to engage in weight training or resistance training and that children can build muscle mass and build muscle strength and power. In children with CP, there's also been a lot of research that's been done. It's not quite as consistent, but overall it does show that individuals with CP can still get stronger or build, uh, increase their muscle power. So this is kind of a, a busy slide, but basically these are the recommendations um, published by the National Sports and Conditioning, Strength and Conditioning Association uh, for typically developing youth, youth without CP. And currently the proposal is that this is also what individuals with CP use when they're thinking about engaging in strength or power training. A couple things to point out here is the duration is up to 20 weeks. So that's five months. It's a pretty long time. And then the intensity is also fairly high. We use something called a one repetition max to determine how much or what the starting point should be. And this is something that your individual therapist can really help you figure out and determine for yourself. The last thing I want to point out on this slide is just the difference between training for muscle strength versus muscle power. When we talk about training for muscle strength, it's really about moving in a slow and controlled manner. And when we talk about training for muscle power, it's thinking about moving as quickly as possible. In individuals with CP, it's been proposed recently that muscle power might be a little bit more impaired than muscle strength, and that potentially we want to think about focusing on muscle power, improvements in muscle power to see more effects, uh, more functional changes. So if you're struggling going up and down the stairs or if you're struggling getting up out of a chair, it might be more important to think about training for muscle power. So we'll move on to the next slide and go a little bit more practically speaking. What, is, what does this mean if you wanna start uh, weight training or resistance training? First, it's gonna be important that you talk to your therapist about any modifications that might need to be made uh, to ensure that you're able to do this safely and effectively. And also talk to them about determining what resistance might be right for you. As we saw, it may take up to 20 weeks or longer to see changes. So strength training or power training is going to be something that needs to be moved out of therapy, out of clinic hours, and be something that you can feel comfortable doing in your community or in your school or in your home. And this is also something that your therapist um, can help you figure out and problem solve. And then finally, there's... As Sudarshan mentioned, research is continuous, ongoing. So over time, there may be 
changes to the current recommendations. So just continuing to touch base with your local therapist may be a good idea in terms of determining what the right training regimen is for you, is specifically to address your specific goals. So after looking at strength and resistance training, let's move on to looking at muscle length. So as Sudarshan mentioned, as we grow, our muscles also grow in length. And it's very common in individuals with CP to develop contractures over time or to develop joints that don't uh, move as far as they should. So knees may be stuck in a bent position. Ankles may be pointed downward a little bit. And we need to figure out ways to help with that. Um, some research has shown that therapy or therapeutic interventions can have positive effects on muscle length and either preventing some of these contractures or improving some of these contractures over time. One intervention that's been looked at is use of a stander or standing frame. When all of the research was looked at that had addressed using this intervention. When it was all compiled together, the recommendation that came from it was that you would need to use the standard for uh, 45 to 60 minutes, five to seven days a week to see improvements at the knee and at the ankle, at the hip, um, so that they're getting straighter and in a better position over time. But you would need to do it for basically every day, 60 minutes a day to see those effects, which is a, a lot. There's also been some research looking at combining passive range of motion. So that would be like someone else or a robot stretching you and then also active motion. So you moving your elbow or your knee or your ankle on your own. Um, one of the studies that looked at this implemented a program of 60 minutes a day or 60 minutes at a time, three to five times a week, where a robotic device would move a child's ankle up and down for about 20 minutes. And then that child would have to move their ankle on their own. And it was a cool system that was actually developed partly by Dr. Gabler. It's called the Intelligent Stretcher. So the kids got to play little video games with their ankle while they're moving it around. Um, but they saw some positive effects of ankle range of motion with that as well. So that was a lot of information, but again, what does it mean for us? We'll go to the next slide and kind of talk about that just a little bit more, the practical side of it. So when we think about, as a therapist, when I think about how to really work as hard as possible on preventing or improving contractures, what I want to think about is how do I build this into someone's daily life so that they can get in an ideal position as much as possible. So instead of encouraging maybe 10 to 15 minutes of stretching in the morning, instead what I would encourage is that you try and wear the braces that have been recommended to you for 10 or 12 hours um, or that <clears throat> You think about when you're sleeping, what position are you sleeping in? Because that's another 10 hours of your day. And that positioning yourself in, in these resting positions is going to be more important than getting those that little bit of stretching in. Then also um, looking at the idea of actively moving. I think that's going to be also an important thing that I encourage my patients to do. So are there activities that you really enjoy doing? Is it maybe dance class, karate class, going to a swimming pool where you are moving your body through bigger ranges of motion um, in order to improve upon that? And then finally, I think what's really important for us to remember is that at this point in time, despite your best efforts of doing everything that your therapist tells you, positioning yourself in really great positions throughout the day, you may still need surgical intervention at some point um, to optimize the position that your body is in or what you're able to do. And that's not in any ways a, a failure of those activities. It's more that we just need to keep learning more about how uh, muscles in individuals with CP respond to stretch and what's going to be best um, over time for them. 
So let's go on to Teresa, and she's going to talk a little bit about that endurance part of it. Yeah, and I get to talk about one of the most important muscles in our body, which is our heart, and thinking about endurance and cardiovascular um, health and movement and how that is related. And so we, like what Kara did with some of the other muscles of our body, we start by thinking about what is recommended for any kids. And so as you may be aware, a number of professional organizations have recommended 60 minutes of daily activity for any kids. Um, kids with di diagnoses, kids without diagnoses, that's just part of being healthy as a kid. And there's a couple of ways to do that. So you could either do that in moderate ways where you might be, um, you know, swimming or doing lower impact kinds of activities or more vigorous ways. Maybe you play on a sports team or, you know, you run cross country or something like that where you're really losing your breath and maybe sweating a little bit. That's an example of something that would be considered more of a, a vigorous activity. And so you have options for the kinds of ways that you like to move and like to have fun to get these kinds of exercise in. Uh, the caveat to this or something to think about is if you're starting from a place where you're a little deconditioned, so we might say out of shape, or maybe it's not something that you've done as much before if you're trying to make some changes. Um, if you're starting from that place where you get tired pretty easily or you get out of breath pretty easily, we don't start with a 60 minutes right away. So we would rarely recommend going from zero to 60 um, just like that. So you might start from 20 minutes or so and thinking about more of the um, moderate kinds of activities that involve pretty big movements um, with lots of big muscle groups. So things like swimming or um, even walking or hiking or something like that. We can go to the next slide. So for adults, we also have recommendations and our recommendations are um, not quite every day necessarily, but thinking more about the week as a whole. Because we know as you start to have a job or, or do things, your weekdays and weekend might look a little bit different as you become an adult. And so we have some guidelines as far as minutes of activity, again, kind of broken down if you do really vigorous activity where you work very, very hard, um, you don't necessarily need to do quite as many minutes in the week. Um, if you like to do things that don't make you sweat quite as much, you have to do that for a few more minutes for the health of your heart. And really the bottom line, especially for us adults that spend so much of our day sitting oftentimes, just move more and sit less. Um, I, I think it was a public health campaign recently that said that sitting is the new smoking. Um, now that we've gotten so much better about um, having the smoking rates in our country a lot lower, uh, now we just need to stand up and move a little bit more as some general recommendations. And then on the next slide, we also have um, some specific recommendations for individuals with cerebral palsy, aerobic um, activity. And so these are published guidelines, um, not by me, but by other experts in the field as well, that take some of these activity recommendations for anybody and try to tailor them a little bit and just say that this is what is still a good idea, even if you have cerebral palsy. So those recommendations are two to four sessions every week. Um, at least 20 minutes in the session and a moderate intensity. So maybe not fully out of breath, but losing your breath a little bit and, and feeling like you're working. And really at the end of the day, reducing that sitting around. We classify that as or call that sedentary behaviors. So that just means where you're not getting your heart rate up at all. You're not doing a lot of movement. Um, and so the bottom line is doing something is better than nothing. And the reason that there is no duration on this, it, I didn't say do this for 20 weeks, like Kara said, do strength, strengthening for 20 weeks to get stronger, is because we really see these as lifestyle changes. If you wanna keep your heart healthy over your lifespan, you, you wanna be thinking about making these changes for the rest of your life. And on the next slide, um, we just have some general recommendations and kind of take home messages and an action plan. What are the couple steps that we should all be thinking about taking in terms of those lifestyle changes? 
And so I would really think that the first thing to do is think about what you like doing to move. If you like doing something, it's a lot easier to do it every day. So what kind of movement do you enjoy? Kara talked about, um, you know, things like dance or karate. Maybe it's more social when we're not in a pandemic and you'd like to meet other people to exercise together. Um, maybe you like to lift weights and do that more regularly or go to the park with somebody. So thinking about what you like doing and then what your family likes doing or what your friends like doing and making it a joint venture. Um, habits can be easier to change when you know you're in it with somebody else. Uh, aim to move every day and try to get out of breath every once in a while and maybe more than every once in a while, a couple times a week. And then just keep at it. Keep uh, doing those things to keep your active lifestyle going uh, for long-term health benefits. Okay. So then the final slide um, kind of builds on what Teresa was just discussing there. But really for all of us, if we want to improve our physical fitness, if we want to get stronger, if we want to be healthier, we really have to think about lifestyle changes. So. The recommended dosage for a lot of these things is going to be way too much to complete just during therapy sessions. It really is things that have to be done at home, at school, in your community, and become a part of, of our daily lives. Um, so then the big question is, how do we how do we do that outside of therapy sessions? I, I think we all know it, it is a little bit tougher right now, um, being stuck at home or being in a position where you're really not interacting with other people as much. Um, so it's a good time to think about, you know, are there some virtual classes that you can join? Or does your family as a whole maybe go for a bike ride together? There's some really great um, adaptive bike equipment that you can look at getting, that there's some different programs or different grants that you can look through. And actually, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab has a, a program every year where they help to look for some of those bikes and what might be, might be best for you. Um, and then also, in addition to kind of building up the, the physical fitness part of it, when we think about um, our muscles and uh, improving the length of our muscles, that's also another really good chance to build it into your daily routine of, you know, are you coming home from school or, or finishing virtual school and watching half hour of TV? Would that be maybe a good time to get in your stander or wear that knee brace for a little bit longer? Um, we're really lucky to have Lark and her family, the, their family talking a little bit later. And I think they will hopefully have some really great uh, ideas and suggestions for us as well. And then I think we also have a little bit of time right now to maybe come back as a panel and answer any other specific questions um, and hopefully address this a little bit more. Hi, and thank you. And welcome back to all our speakers. Um, thank you so much for such wonderful talks. And we are actually getting lots of questions in, so I hope you're ready um, to answer some of these. One of the first one that has come in is uh, talking about muscles. And the question is, how does spasticity um, affect muscles? Like, how are my muscles different um, compared to if I didn't have spasticity? Dr. Gabler, can you just uh, kick start us off with that question? Right, I'd be happy to. Um, spasticity um, is easy to say, but it's a little bit harder to get a um, handle on. Um, the definition is that spasticity is a velocity resistance to stretch. So when you have a muscle that has spasticity, when you move quickly, that muscle will react um, in a way that is a little exaggerated. So uh, what you would feel as a person with spasticity is that when you start to move quickly, your muscles may appear as if they're not as able to, to uh, have a greater range of motion or as great a range of motion, and they also may feel tight. Um, it used to be that uh, there was an old adage that you couldn't strengthen a spastic muscle, but that's now been very much debunked. So we know that um, muscles that have some spasticity can um, uh, it have the benefits of exercise, but typically um, the, the spasticity will affect the, the movement 
because it will um, not allow as smooth a trajectory and will have a reduced range of motion when the child is, uh, or when, when the person is moving. So let's say, for example, you start to run, and if you're starting to try to have a heel toe, you may start running just on your toes, or you might have a, a more narrow base of support versus a wider base of support. And that's what will um, sort of affect the movement. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, maybe Sudarshan to comment a little bit more about um, his exploration on um, the microscopic or the tissue level changes, if he knows, or if it's in development. Sure, I, I can do that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, the, the, I mean, the short answer is we don't have a clear idea uh, in, of the level of the of, of level of microscopic things, the things I was talking about. What we do know is that there are changes for sure that happen because when we look at muscles from kids who are having surgery, they've had spasticity, they've had treatment for spasticity, and yet their contractors, uh, in some cases, like, have progressed to the point where they need surgery. And so the, the two things which uh, Dr. Gabriel mentioned is in terms of movement, the muscles becoming bigger and the, the range of motion, those things, I think, might have an impact indirectly or directly and satellite cells and how they're functioning during the day. But, you know, there are people looking into it, uh, and hopefully in the next few years, we'll have more answers. Um, there are people in Belgium who are trying to do some of these biopsies in younger kids who are not having surgery to figure out what, what it actually looks like. And so hopefully within a few years, we'll have better answers of how that changes as kids are growing. So I think that leads actually very nicely into the next question, which is, does therapy or does exercise and all these different things that we've spoken about with movement, is that leading to changes in the muscle or is it leading to changes in the brain? Dr. Gabler, I might let you start that one as well. Mm. I would say it's probably going to be both. Um, I know that we can absolutely uh, talk about the impact of muscle, but we know that uh, the brain is also very adaptable. And um, in terms of motor learning uh, and learning a skill that is uh, consistent, that even uh, the oldest on this panel can still learn motor skills and so that you can affect the change at a brain level or at least at a learning level. And uh, certainly, um, the idea of, of neuroplasticity is, is something that um, is very, uh, very important. Um, Teresa, you might have comments on the neuroplasticity, and then maybe we could bump it to Sudarshan on the muscle. Sure, yeah. Um, so definitely, as you mentioned, Dr. Gabler, you know, if you take up a new activity, your brain needs to respond differently and change in order to become skilled at that activity. So as we develop motor skills, whether or not we have cerebral palsy, as we get better at them, that's a reflection of our brain doing a better job and our nervous system becoming better at being able to do that task. And so we have, as a scientific community, different opportunities to, to kind of look at that using different kinds of imaging. And so there are a wide range of studies that have looked at how the brain changes when we exercise more. And so I think that it is very encouraging that what we need to do is continue to keep moving and keep moving in ways that we can sustain because this is, again, where dose comes up. The more that you do something, the more potential you have to impact those brain changes. I think that's so important. And I just want to remind everybody, if you've got any other questions, please put them in the chat function because we are here to answer as many for you as possible. And so, Sudarshan, just expanding on that a little bit when it comes to muscles and the change that may be occurring in them through therapy. Um, <laughs> I know that we're still sort of at the forefront of some of this research, but where are we? So I think a lot of people are looking at what happens to muscles after therapy. So even though I'd be talking at a microscopic level, people are measuring things in other ways using imaging, uh, for example, or other ways in which you can measure strength and power. And clearly therapy has an impact on muscle and 
the brain obviously is controlling the muscle as well. So I would say in terms of some of the therapies, uh, the, the goal is to actually help recruit the right muscles to be able to make the muscles bigger. So it's, it's you know, from a therapeutic point, it's it's pretty much the same thing that I was talking about. You're helping the muscles grow in, in some ways and prevent contractors from happening. Rachel, I'd like to add one more thing that I don't think you can underestimate the impact of uh, the mood boost and also the feeling of well-being. Uh, there have been many studies, um, especially in adults, in terms of fatigue and pain, that uh, that can be reduced after exercise. And I think it's uh, there's a lot of overlap with um, the release of of um, improvement of well-being. So I think that's an important aspect uh, that we don't want to um, ignore. Absolutely. And Cara, actually, I might go to you for this next question because it, it sort of is leading on from that as well is, you know, how can someone with cerebral palsy exercise at home during the pandemic? I know you spoke about some potential different options, but, you know, it is really hard right now. And, you know, as uh, Dr. Gabler just said how important it is for our well-being, for our mental health, to make sure that we still are exercising. What are some of the options for people when they're at home? Yeah, so we there's a there's a plethora of options is the the easy answer for me. But I think if we're talking about specifics, um, you know, maybe one arm is stronger than the other or one hand is functioning better than the other and you can't necessarily use dumbbells in both hands. You can think about filling a sock up with rice and putting it around your wrist or getting some cuff weights to use. You can think about um, going outside with your family and just going on a walk around the block. Um, you can... Uh, what are some other modifications? Sometimes we'll use a backpack and put some books in the backpack and use that as a weight instead of using weights at a gym. Um, and they can do some strength training with that. If you're in a wheelchair, you can definitely do a lot of the strength training activities as well. And then you can build that endurance piece up um, by thinking about, all right, normally you might go outside and you do two blocks. So can you slowly build that up to three blocks, four blocks? Um, even during during the winter months, I know in Chicago, that's a little bit harder to do. Um, so it may be that you think about doing a little bit more of the strength training piece of it in your home during the winter versus that getting out and doing some endurance stuff. Um, Teresa, maybe you have some other specific suggestions as well. Yeah, you know, one thing I think about this pandemic, there's a lot of things that we could say negative about it, but there is some silver linings in what is available mm -hmm. remotely. So there are a lot of organizations that have online training options. Um, so in our community, I know the Great Lakes Adaptive Sports Association is one example of a community-based program that it has continued in the pandemic and is connecting in ways that mean that you don't need to go to their gym that they can find ways to help you train while you're there. Also, um, remote health care is continuing. So you can still ask your physical therapist, for me, what are the muscles I should be working on and problem solve? Like Kara said, I have, I have rice, I have a sock, I don't need a gym to do that one exercise that we talked about. So I think it's about kind of deciding what it is that you need and then, um, there are some options that are like kind of ready-made available and then there are other ones that you can get support from your healthcare provider to see how to to tailor some of those things but it it has really been nice to see how many things have emerged that you don't necessarily need to leave your home for and i also know there's been some organizations that maybe don't typically aren't typically geared um towards exercise groups or activities to do at home. Um, I know there was a ballet program mm -hmm. that doesn't typically do home programming or even in-person programming, but they had time. So they set up a couple different dance experiences with Broadway dancers specifically targeted towards individuals um, with CP or individuals that aren't able to move quite the same way that other people are able to move. So as Teresa said, I do think with, with the pandemic, if, if you do some searching, there's some really cool organizations that are opening up some unique experiences for, for everyone right now. 
Yeah, I think it is really amazing. I'm excited that you actually brought up the ballet because I think that is for everybody as well because there's questions coming in and Teresa, I'm going to ask you this question as well. We've spoken a lot about mobility and a lot about movement and these questions are coming in. If What if my child is in a wheelchair and is unable to stand? I know, Cara, you touched on it briefly, but could you just expand a little bit further about some of those activities that you can do um, if you are in a wheelchair or if you have um, some more severe mobility difficulties? Uh, thanks. I'm so glad that question came up because um, when we consider exercises, I think sometimes we have a particular image that comes to our mind and it doesn't fit everybody. So some examples that I think work great, even for individuals that use a wheelchair for their primary mobility is anything that can make movement a little bit easier, such as swimming. So when you get into the water, it's a little bit freeing. It's easier to get your arms and your legs to move in ways that it might not if you tried to stand and walk across a room. So that's one example. Um, something that's a little bit less uh, widely available right now that I'm really excited about is um, a running frame. So it's kind of a supportive way to be able to exercise in a pretty rigorous way, a vigorous way. Um, where it's kind of like a tricycle without pedals. And so you have trunk support, you have ways to keep your body safe, but mm -hmm. you can still move your legs quite quickly. And it's not about running form per se, you can move them however they move to move yourself forward. And so that's a, an example of a device that provides an adaptive way of moving and uh, participating in the community that I'm pretty excited about right now. Um, and I'll turn it over to Kara for some other uh, comments. Yeah, I was just going to comment. As Teresa said, uh, a lot of people are still receiving or able to receive some of those therapy services um, through telehealth right now. So it's a really good question to ask your individual therapist as well. Mm -hmm. And going going forward, if it's not something that you're looking at, how can we do right now? But how can we do in three months from now? How can we do in four months from now? There's lots of adaptive equipment that you can look at getting. So as I mentioned before, there's different adapt adaptive bicycles and there's some um, different grant programs that can help to pay for those. Different gait trainers, so supportive walking devices that insurance can sometimes pay for. And then also, as Teresa kind of mentioned in her slides, any increase in movement is good. So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, picking up a weight. You know, if if your, your child is a little bit more impaired and really needs more help to move, could it be something as simple as when they're sitting in the wheelchair, you toss a ball and they just even move their arm through small ranges to kind of hit that back to you. Really any movement that's more than they typically are doing can count as exercise. And Rachel, I want to mention, um, I've seen studies in adults in Japan where they do um, ballroom dancing in wheelchairs and they can, uh, they can uh, create a cardiovascular response. So I think that, that uh, there, there are options. Another option I know for uh, uh, folks that aren't able to stand can even be horseback riding. There's, there. I, I think it's just, it, it's sort of adaptive, but also things that that call to the person that really feeds their, um, um, you know, I, as I say, it isn't just to move. Movement should be joyful. So you have to find something that sort of, uh, it's like spark joy with your movement. <laughs> And I think, you know, we've spoken a lot about movement and the different types of exercise. We've had some other questions that have come in that are more about sort of some of these intensive therapy options. And one of them in particular is asking, so what are some of the non-surgical options? I know in one of the slides we talked about uh, some surgical different procedures that may actually have to end up happening. But what are some of the other surgical options that you might pair with some short-term therapy? Dr. Gabler, um, do you have any sorts of overviews of what people can do, particularly right. And was about, you know, if I have spasticity, how, how does, what do I do? Right. Uh, typically for the rehab doc, you're always in communication with the team. Um, so it's, it's never just a unilateral decision. The parent, the child, and the therapist, and the uh, surround, what do they need to be able to do? So I think that in terms of options, modalities, I, I think modalities can be very helpful. Vibration, the, there's uh, sometimes cold will help 
um, muscle tone. Uh, there are a lot of oral medications to consider if side effect profile doesn't impact and if you feel that it would improve a goal. Uh, there are neurolytics in terms of uh, specific focal injections that can be done with some of the um, uh, alcohol, phenol, or toxins. Um, and I think that even things um, that I think exercise itself can reduce the stretch reflex mm -hmm. and uh, can improve the, the, um, the reactivity of the muscle. Um, so I think that there are a lot of options to reduce muscle tone to gain more range of motion so that you have a more complete um, ability to move the, the limb or the extremity. This next question's um, just come in and it is in relation to botulinum toxin and using botulinum toxin in combination with, say, serial casting. Um, does anyone want to sort of comment on that as a sort of a, a mode of actual treatment? I, I would. I'd like to say that um, uh, I'm very big on having muscles to be strong mm -hmm. and uh, muscles activate. So uh, this was one of the, the uh, reasons we investigated looking at a stretching device that would train the muscles and strengthen the muscles and not just immobilize the muscles. It is clear that you can gain range with uh, um, um, serial casting or with a botulinum toxin. And the question is, what is uh, the most effective for each individual child? Um, I, I love to keep the muscle out of immobilization so that the muscle is always moving. Um, but it, it obviously not, uh, if, if there is a contracture, then a, certainly a serial cast is an option that may um, delay or even avoid uh, a surgical procedure to that joint. And Sadashan, I'd like you, if you could just elaborate a little bit more when we're thinking about what's happening to the muscle during a stretch. Um, you know, when we're thinking about serial casting, that's what it's doing. It's sort of stretching out that muscle and, and trying to do it. Or if we're trying to even think about a more active device, like similar to the one um, that Dr. Dave Gable was talking about earlier. Yeah, so when I was talking about satellite cells, I was talking about activation of satellite cells, and you're talking about your running or whatever activity which cause micro tears. That in reality, when you think about muscle growth, what happens to your bones growing? The bones putting a stretch on the muscle, and the muscle responds by activating these satellite cells. And so, stretch is a very strong activator of satellite cells, and that's uh, well known. So, that's sort of uh, partly the way we think muscle growth is using that stretch response. And so, this next question I want to ask actually. Um, to Cara, because we, we talked about telehealth and all these different options that are available. And obviously, um, in Chicago, you also have a lot of wonderful uh, pieces available. Are they, um, can people access that right now? What, what's actually happening if they want to be able to access some of these? Programs? Yeah, so if, if you are in the city or near the city, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab is open um, for treating inpatients and outpatients currently. And some of the things that we have at uh, our main site that are pretty unique, we have uh, the Locomat, which is kind of like a full body robotic system over a treadmill that can help you simulate walking um, in a better pattern. We have uh, prosthetics and orthotics available still. So looking at different brace options or different looking at fabricating custom braces for you. Um, there's within outpatient, we also have some different things to work with younger kids. So we have something called the Go Baby Go um, evaluation. So looking at developing, using power wheels to create um, early mobility devices for some of our youngest patients, two and three year olds, which is maybe a fun thing to do in your home, maybe not. <laughs> um, we have uh, functional electrical simulation, so different devices that we can attach you to to specifically target particular muscles in your legs or your arms that are connected to virtual reality gaming or different programs like that. Um, and then there's multiple outpatient sites that are also still open. They're taking precautions, so seeing less 
patients at a time than usual and making sure everyone is masked and spaced out, mm -hmm. but they still are open um, for you guys to come in and get therapy treatment in person right now. Some of the therapists are also doing a combination of telehealth visits and in-person therapy, depending on what each individual needs. And then also, as I mentioned, um, looking at equipment that might be helpful for you to have a, in the home, whether that is a device that will help you walking, if your wheelchair needs an upgrade, um, that we're still having a clinic open for that. So if there's a piece of equipment that your physician thinks that you need, then you're able to come in and be evaluated for that, sometimes in person, um, sometimes over telehealth, depending on what type of equipment it is. And for those who are watching who are outside of Chicago um, right now, is there an, does uh, Shelley Ryan Ability Lab, for example, have satellites anywhere else across the country or, you know, are they able to access any of these pieces? So we're primarily located in Illinois, but there are great re rehab uh, facilities all over the country that I'm sure if you um, talk with your physician or look online, you'll be able to find some really, really great resources in your community. Um, and then I don't know if maybe uh, Dr. Gabler or Teresa want to talk about some other resources online that you could access that aren't necessarily Shirley Ryan Ability Lab specific, but maybe some other resources that that might be helpful. Teresa, would you like to um, elaborate on some of those other resources that people can access if they're from other parts of the country? Yeah, so I guess um, in terms of activity, Activity and movement, is that what you're asking about yes. or in terms of yes. services? Oh, well, both really. I, I think the question came through just saying, okay, I, I'm not in Chicago, but obviously they love what they're hearing. You know, how mm -hmm. and where can they access some of these things? Yeah, um, so there is the the national, like, it starts NCH PAD, the National Center for Healthy... Dr. Gabler, can you help me on the last yeah, part? Nip, uh, physical... yeah, pad. It's Nick. Yes. We decided we could never remember how to say it. Uh, yes, I don't know the, the correct way to say the acronym or, or apparently what the acronym exactly is for, but they're actually based in Alabama, but they are really focused on having a network of opportunities for people that uh, might need adaptations in order to access um, healthy living opportunities as it relates to exercise. And so they actually have some really nice advocacy resources. So even if like they may have locations that you could go to that are already set up, but they also have information about how you can talk to your gym about what your needs are in order to be able to access that space. And so that's the one thing that I might add as like another opportunity to perhaps create what you want in your own community if you don't happen to live in Chicago and or have access to a metropolitan area with that type of a system. And we'll make sure that any of the resources or anything that was spoken about um, during the panel we'll make sure that you can share them. We'll put them either in the description of this particular video and we'll also share them over our social media. Now I've got two more questions um, before we move to the family panel because I think they're both really important. One of them is actually about sort of intensives. So, you know, we've spoken about trying to change the muscle. We've spoken about doing all these different things and we've spoken about dose. What about, you know, uh, I suppose, what is the evidence to show that intensives um, work or don't work? And, and, you know, when I talk about intensives, I think they're talking about like a two-week intensive therapy block, for example. Tara, would you like to start with that one? So I think it kind of depends on what your current goals are. Um, so I work a lot in inpatient rehab where it really is intensive therapy. So three hours of therapy a day, six days a week. And typically, we would recommend that after um, a big change. So individuals with CP typically come to us after surgical intervention. So whether that's muscle lengthening or bony surgery, they come to us after they're out of their cast and everything. And we see them for two to three weeks, two hours of PT, an hour of OT every single day. They're up, they're moving. And in that case, I think the idea of as much as possible right after surgery to capitalize on those gains and really prepare you for going back home is going to be important. 
Um, and then in terms of research and evidence of should you do four weeks of therapy three days a week or should you do three months of therapy once a week, it's, it's pretty mixed based on what you need. So it's going to be something, a conversation that you really are going to need to have with your individual therapist, with your individual physician to figure out what the right thing for you is. And this is a question and I was actually going to ask Sudarshan, but I think his uh, connection has just been lost. So um, Dr. Gabler, I'm going to actually ask you this one is, you know, when we're looking at this, so we've done an intensive, you know, we're seeing some gains and some changes are they long lasting? Like how long would some of these changes last? Uh, well, we hope it's a feed forward mechanism that as you are uh, obtaining skills, you're, you're continuing to prax practice and continuing to use them. And I think that the brain does um, act if you, you use it or lose it. You want to use it and perfect it. Um, and so that uh, whatever you have gained, you need to continue on. Now, the, the, the issue for the, the kids is as they grow, there may be a change in body mass and a change in alignment that you always have to be attentive to so that you can continue that progress. Um, I think that uh, there is a natural history of improvement that we understand and we know. And uh, sometimes the fight is just not to uh, lose a skill. And so I think it's very important if you have gained a skill and if you start to lose it, that that's a perfect time to reconsider your program and think, do you need to intensify? Do you need to change um, a medication or do you need further intervention? So it's, it's, very, um, it's a very difficult question, but I think that we want to see maintenance and continued uh, use of skills. Um, one thing I think that, uh, as, as we, I said early on, when we're thinking about the, the kids that we see in adults, we always want to consider what are the research studies that are available to them so that we can try to push that envelope. Uh, I can tell you 100% we're always trying to do more intensive programs and, and not just in motor, but in speech and language. So. Um, to do that, it's really, it takes a team that we, such as what we've put together here tonight. So I think I, I thank you guys for coming out Absolutely. with. I can't thank you all enough for actually being here this evening. And before we move on to our family panel, because I'm very excited to introduce everybody to the Johnson family. Um, is there any other final thoughts, uh, Cara, Teresa, that you might have? I have one thing that I'll just mention and to piggyback off of what Dr. Gabler just mentioned about, you know, the the gaps that we still have and the importance of continuing to partner with people with cerebral palsy across the lifespan to really understand, you know, where we should be intervening, how what we're doing right now is working, how we can make improvements and what we should change about the way that we approach individual situations. Um, so another hat that I wear is helping to coordinate um, the cerebral palsy research registry, which is just a way to kind of match make um, people that want to know more about research and get involved um, with the scientists that are doing it and the, and the clinicians. And so I think that's the way that we're going to continue to move forward is by working together um, to, to find good answers to the right questions. Absolutely. I think that's perfect. Um, almost ending if you have it. Cara, obviously. Um, no, she, she wrapped it up perfectly. <laughs> but in saying that, I have just had one more question come through and I want to make sure it gets answered because obviously we do have such wonderful people who are joining us here this evening. Um, and it's a question for the panellists. Uh, thinking about physical therapy based on fascia manipulation. So looking at the fascia and looking at manipulation of the fascia. Um, Cara, uh, any comments or thoughts? on that i think every part of your body is important <laughs> mm -hmm. um and we need to address all of the components so looking at skin looking at fascia looking at muscle looking at bone um 
I don't have specific experience and I have not looked into the research of that recently. Um, I don't know if Dr. Gabler or Teresa have other input, but I think, yeah, I, I'm, I have not done very much with that, but it's a part of your body. So it's a okay thing to, to look at. Yeah, I think that there's quite a bit of um, uh, understanding about um, the collagen being stiffer for um, children with CP and also adults. And so that fascial manipulation, I'm not sure what the mechanism is exactly, but it is used for pain relief and especially in um, trying to uh, reduce some of the tightness. And Teresa, you may have other um, thoughts about My comment it was just going to be that I think that is a perfect example of something that we really need to understand yeah. more about. Yeah. That there is perhaps some promising case studies or anecdotal reports. I have not seen, you know, we talk about levels of evidence. I haven't seen the highest level of evidence for that kind of an intervention. And so I'd be cautiously optimistic that that if you're being recommended or if you're seeing benefit that it's real, but you know, we just don't have enough information to, to say one way or the other at this point. I think that is actually such a real a important thing. And actually before we move on, and I'm sorry, the Johnson family is waiting and I really do want to get to them, but it is the whole concept of the best level of evidence and, you know, being able to judge what is and what isn't. Teresa, can you just elaborate that on a little bit more? Because it's really hard for everybody. If they're on the internet, they're searching potentially a, a therapy or something that you've seen, you know, how do they know what level of evidence is backing up um, those claims or, or behind what's being said? Such a wonderful and important question. And I'll try to keep, it's, it could be a big topic, so I'll try to keep it on a, a, a basic level. So it kind of sp spreads a spectrum from, my next door neighbor said that their friend benefited from this to we have thousands of people that have received this intervention. And we understand that if you have these characteristics, you will benefit and you will get better. And then everything in between. And really, we don't we have very, very few things, if anything, in cerebral palsy that's of the like thousands of people have done this. We know for a fact it works. And we have kind of a lot on my neighbor's aunt did this. <laughs> um, and so we just want to push ourselves in the direction of randomized controlled trials are the things that we really need to be able to stand over. And that means that you have a group of people and you randomly decide, do you get an intervention or don't you? And in a blinded way at the end of it, you have somebody say the thing that we wanted to make better the people that got the intervention, they all got better. And those that didn't get the intervention didn't. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the best that we would be looking for is if you see something that has passed the test and the rigor of a randomized control trial, that's what I would be looking for in, in the interventions I'd be considering. Well, I just want to say thank you again for Therese, to Teresa and Cara and obviously Sadasha, who um, unfortunately dropped off there at the end. But I just want to say a huge thank you for uh, spending the time with us this evening um, and giving us such a wealth of knowledge and, and so many new things. I'm sure everyone has been enlightened as of I. But now I would actually like to invite um, the Johnson family and I'll invite um, Dr. Gabler to stay on with me as well. And we're really excited um, for the Johnson family to be joining us. Uh, we have uh, this evening, um, we've spoken about obviously a lot about the different things that are happening when it comes to um, the, the physical things as well as, you know, what's happening in the clinical setting or what's happening in a research setting. But, you know, we really want to know, well, what's actually happening um, in real life? And I think that's some of the most important things that we can actually discuss. You know, we, we can talk about all of these things potentially in a theoretical framework, but we want to know what's happening in real life. And, you know, the Johnson family is a family who is... Um, has been very involved, obviously, in research actually from the very beginning. But um, yeah, we'd love to have them join us um, if we can. And um, very excited um, to have, and I'll, I'll do an introduction um, here. So on screen, uh, we have Lark in the middle. Lark, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have uh, Mum Angela. And then we have Dad uh, Amand. And then we have to, just out of frame, 
uh, the little brother Asa. So thank you so much um, for all of you being uh, here. And actually, like, I'm going to start off with you because, you know, you've listened to what we've been talking about this evening and, and you have participated in a lot of these different, I suppose, research studies and you're living what we're talking about. Um, how has your experience um, been within research? What, what are some of your experiences? Actually, before that, I'm going to take a step back. Can you just introduce yourself to everybody and let them know who you are and what you love to do? Hi, sure. Hi, my name is Lily Johnson. I'm 16. I am a junior in high school. I'm currently involved in ballet and horseback riding. And I, we love that you're involved in ballet and horseback riding because we've heard, obviously, from everyone on our um, panel just how important some of these recreation are. Can you dive into a little bit? Uh, deeper. How did you get involved in ballet? Um, I was involved in ballet through Gatsu Gamer. She was the one that recommended to my mom, and my mom took me. And so, when you're doing ballet, and um, you know, I've heard that you're actually uh, not just good at doing ballet, but also a wonderful choreographer. Um, when you're doing ballet, what's some of the most, um, what are the benefits that you've seen? You know, um, have you seen some of the physical benefits that we've spoken about this evening? The benefits for ballet are stamina, strength, and the freedom to express myself for movement. And I think that's wonderful to hear actually coming from you to say yes when i'm doing ballet these are the things that are happening and this is what's changing in my body and how it's making me feel um dr gabler obviously um you have been a part of the johnson's family life and lark's life for a very long time um angela i'm gonna go uh back to you and and get you to sort of introduce yourself as well but you know let's start uh back at the beginning uh, around when um, Lark first got her diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Uh, yes, when Lark first got her diagnosis, it was I think she was about nine months old. Uh, prior to us actually having a specific diagnosis, she was already receiving services through early interventions because she had not made her uh, various uh, uh, milestones. Um, she had excessive drooling. She wasn't holding her head up. Um, once we got the diagnosis, um, husband and I, we had our 24 hour pity party and the very next day we looked at each other and said, okay, time to roll up our sleeves and dig in and see what this thing about cerebral palsy is and what that means for us and for our daughter. And we assembled our entire family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, godparents, friends of the family. Um, we were fortunate to have our early intervention therapist come and we just had a whole discussion about what is cerebral palsy, what would life look like for Lark, uh, because none of us knew. It was all brand new to us. And uh, they gave answered questions about what cerebral palsy was, what certain expectations we could have for Lark. At that time, of course, it was too, she was too young to truly know um, what the future would hold. And then from there, uh, that led us to uh, getting in touch with Dr. Gabler. Dr. Gabler became her doctor. And um, a lot of the things that were mentioned tonight, we've tried. <laughs> we've tried, uh, you know, the horseback riding, ballet, uh, swimming, yoga. Uh, we take walks as a family. We do running together as a family um, uh, for, to supplement speech services, she's currently taking voice lessons to help with her articulation and voice control, um, breath control. Um, so yes, we've, we've done it all. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what one specific thing was the thing. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I think it's been a combination of everything. Not only has it helped her as an individual with cerebral palsy in terms of her physicalness, but also her mental health, giving her activities that are comparable to what her peers are involved in. 
uh, and just giving her a social life as well. There are some of her very good friends that she's met through some of the activities that she's been involved in and um, just keeping her moving. And I think it's just been overall beneficial for her. It's been beneficial for us too. It keeps us moving as well. Absolutely. I love how connected you are as a family and really how much of, you know, this team that is behind you. Um, and Dr. Gabler, I might hand it over to you actually, because you know, obviously the Johnson family far better than I do. Um, you've known them for a very long time. When you were uh, first looking at, when you first met Lark and you were thinking, all right, what is available um, for her? How can I, you know, give this family what they need? What were some of the first things that came to mind? Uh, well, I think I always knew that Lark was never going to be lonely because there was rarely a visit that didn't include at least three or four adults and uh, a couple others. <laughs> so, so we had a lot of great input. And um, even though we're talking about activity, I'm looking at the whole child. So I'm also thinking, is this going to be a child who does their homework? Are they going to get up and be independent? Are they going to be able to fix their own meals? And um, from the beginning, I had the sense that there was a lot of motivation that was internalized within the group. So um, I, for me, it was almost, and I don't know if I've said it, oh, you don't have to do so much. You know, that there, that there is such a um, robust uh, enthusiasm that uh, it's contagious for me because I'm uh, very happy when I have someone who is motivated to say, oh, well, did you know about the Nutcracker? And they're going to be having kids in the Nutcracker. And can I have you talk to my, um, at that time, we had a researcher in dance. I think you even did our dance research with Sit Lolly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and so that uh, for us, it was a very natural kind of connection to say, uh, there are some families where I may not offer every research study or every intensive camp that we do, but, I, but judging by the family and Lark's ability to handle um, uh, the volume and the complexity of a program, uh, it, was, it, it was like the dream team. So we talked about the dream team, Lark, and obviously you kind of do have the dream team around you. You know, obviously you've had Dr. Gabler as your physician and you've got an incredible mum and dad that are sitting either side of you. So I do have to ask one question, though, because Dr. Gabler did mention, you know, do you do your homework? Because that was the priorities to make sure that that's happening. Yes, yeah, I do my homework and my dad can testify to that. <laughs> Oh, we every night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And you're at that age, I suppose, where you're thinking about lots of different things. But I want to ask you, what has it been like being part of research? You know, it, it's it's a very um, unknown thing for a lot of people because they don't get to experience it. But what's that experience been like for you? I enjoy being a part of research. I enjoy it. Helping scientists and doctors find more information about cerebral party that can help other kids that come after me. I think it's such a wonderful thing to be sort of giving back as you have to so many people. And, you know, we don't know enough as we've learned this evening. You know, there's so much more for us to learn. So we actually can't thank you enough for participating and, and doing all those different things. It, it really is wonderful to give back. Have you seen in um, the research studies as well, have you seen a, a personal benefit? Has there been the changes that the research was hoping to achieve? Did you see any of that in yourself? Yes, I have seen changes from the research studies that I have participated in. I gained strength and endurance from the research studies. If there was one study that you could pick, um, 
that you would love a lot of other people to have access to or you would love to see become part of commonplace when it comes to therapy, what would it be? That's the hard one, but I would have to go with ballet. I would love for there to be more opportunities for kids mm -hmm. with disability to be a part of ballet. Um, the local mm -hmm. net. I would, more research with the local net. Mm -hmm. And can you just describe for the local mat, for those of you, um, and I know I think uh, Teresa brought it up as well, uh, the, the local mat, or maybe it was Cara as an option. Um, can you explain what the local mat is? So for those that, who haven't experienced it, what, you know, what that sort of therapy looks like. The local mat is a canoe with holes that helps kids walk. And while kids are walking, they are able to play like interactive games and the games actually improve the kids walking. And uh, Rachel, I can say that is a randomized controlled trial that we're working with uh, the Canadians uh, between Toronto and Glen Rose. Um, it's a randomized controlled trial, and Lark was lucky that she got the locomat because the other arms are conventional, weightless, or a, com a combination of locomat and uh, more conventional physical therapy. So that is a very important study that Lark helped us with. Um, and so that's an ongoing study right now. So if we're talking about yeah. levels of evidence that Teresa was talking about earlier, it's one that's in the process of looking at what evidence is behind this and, and we'll be able to have hopefully those results shortly. Right. Now we've got some questions coming in. They want to hear from dad. They want to be like, all right, how, <laughs> what's your experience been like? How have you been? And, you know, I think a lot of the time, you know, obviously as mothers, we do get to, you know, go to the appointments and do all these different things. How have you been involved um, with all of the different research and appointments? Well, from from day one, even when Mark was a baby, we would just kind of get on the floor and just work on movement. And <clears throat> those were some of the things that were mentioned to us that we, we just, we start early. If you start early and you kind of incorporate a routine of movement and stretching, it gets the body used to that, to that type of movement that it's not naturally doing. Um, aside from being daddy uber um in-house tutor um <laughs> doctor appointment uh, dad is here we're here and um mm -hmm. we're, we're 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 focusing on trying to make things as much normal as possible we um we we, we teach life we were teaching our life lessons through mm -hmm. everyday living and just normalcy in terms of getting up in the morning brushing your teeth um, fixing your own breakfast. Those are things that, those are, these are life skills that Mark has mm -hmm. actually incorporated on her own and that she's doing now. So we try to continue to encourage that type of independence. And so I'm going to ask this question of both you and Angela. If you could give any advice um, to your, I suppose, your younger self. So when you were, you know, when that diagnosis was first being given and if there is a, a father who's watching this for the first time and who just has a newly diagnosed a child with cerebral palsy, what advice would you give? Um, I would say to remain diligent. It's mm -hmm. not always easy, uh, but to stay encouraged. Uh, over the years, there's been some challenging times, but we just continue to press forward. Um, look into everything that you can. We've looked at parenting magazines. We've mm -hmm. done Google searches. Uh, we've talked to people just walking down the street asking questions if they uh, appear to have a child that had some challenges similar to ours. Uh, there was no path that we didn't at least explore and inquire about. Um, I would certainly say to gather a team. You know, we have we had Dr. Gabler pretty much all of Lark's life, 
and the various therapists that we've interacted with over the years. We still refer to some of them for information. And our family has been an amazing uh, support to us, uh, support to Lark uh, all her life, and I'm sure for the years to come. Herman, what, what advice would you give um, to a family who's maybe early on in their CP journey? Start early with your with therapy as mm -hmm. soon as possible. As soon as you get your diagnosis, <clears throat> find out what you can do at home because that's the key as well. Aside from going out to the rehabs, going to your doctors, there, there are certain things that you can start to incorporate in their lifestyle every day at home that doesn't cost you anything. For example, every night, and Lark may not even remember this, but every night I would put her on the floor and just roll around with her. And then as she got a little older, I would, we would crawl on the floor together. And then as she got a little older and she started liking horses, she tried to get on my back. <laughs> so so the, the biggest key is to start early, mm -hmm. identify where their weaknesses are physically, and then try to incorporate in-home techniques as well as seeking out, out outsourced um, physical therapy. I love that advice. I think it's, it's so important because- one, one more something. Um, unfortunately, there were some families that we've interacted with that um, had a hard time embracing the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And we viewed it as a blessing, if you will, in that we knew what our daughter's specific challenge was. We had a name to it because there were some months that we didn't know what was going on with her. Once we got the diagnosis, it was like, okay, now we know exactly what we're dealing with and we know how to move forward. There are some families who they don't want to uh, really accept the reality of cerebral palsy and what that is. I think if you just go ahead and embrace it and make the most of it, then it's easier for you to move forward and make the best of a life for your child. And Lark, we have so many questions actually now coming in for you. They want to know what's happening with you. What are your plans after school? What do you want to do in your future? <laughs> Big questions, actually, for a 16-year-old. I think that's pretty typical. <laughs> but, you know, what, what are some of the things that you would love to do or, or what do you potentially see yourself doing in the future? In the future, at the high school, I'm hoping to... Study dance in college to become a choreographer. Um, can you expand a little bit on your love, obviously, for dance and ballet? I think that's clear now to everybody, but mm -hmm. wanting to be a choreographer, um, did that come from actually participating in the research? Is, is that where you think your, your love started, was in that first research study? Um, it actually came from in the and seeing all of the behind the scenes action and realizing that there's so much behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's so important, you know, when we talk about, you know, the future and what's possible for all the families that are listening, you know, how important it is to encourage and have expectations and do all these wonderful things because, Lark, there is no doubt that I have that you will be 100% successful in anything that you decide that you want to do. There's no doubt about that. Now, there's actually another question that's come in and they want to know what is your favourite subject at school? My favourite subject is civics. Ah, oh, Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we see a little brother on dad's shoulder there. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your relationship with your little brother? Um, uh, normal brother and sister relationship. Do you fight a lot or do you, are you too close? Um, more close. Yeah. Very close. Very close. And we do uh, horseback riding together. Yeah. And um, over the summer, they uh, Asa helped Lark train in a running program she participated in with Teresa. 
Oh, that's amazing. And Asa, how do you feel like when you're participating in those things with your sister? Good. It's so much fun. I know. I wish I was like horseback riding. That sounds like amazing. <laughs> I want to do more of that. Um, now, next question that's come in, and like everyone wants to know all the fun things that you do. I think that's really what all these questions are about. But besides dance, uh, what's another favourite physical activity? You've talked about horse riding. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Um, I have been a really good episode. I enjoy going horse that way and I enjoy being around horses and learning about them. And Dr. Gabler, can you actually expand on that a little bit more? Because people may have not heard of different horse riding that's available. You know, there's horse riding um, for therapy, so there's something called hippotherapy, and then there's horse riding, obviously, for recreation. Um, what is sort of some of the, is there evidence to back up that horse riding and, and what it does? Uh, well, that's a, a, that's a wonderful question because um, we actually have a robotic horse study going on now for those who can't get to the horses uh, because we are interested in the idea of how uh, the movement of the horse affects the trunk because it acts like a trunk perturbation and that uh, that's a, a in theory that is the sort of evidence that it has been um, uh, brought forward that uh, horseback riding can improve the trunk control and walking. Uh, and there, and you know, I, I should let Teresa take the question about the, the exact level of evidence, but I think that it is fairly respected that it can have a positive impact. Um, and I, I was going to say that there is a stoplight system for all the interventions for cerebral palsy. And I'm not sure if the Cerebral Palsy Foundation has that up on the website. It's actually been already shared in the chat tonight. Oh, so wonderful, it. wonderful. Great. So, um, CPresource.org has all these wonderful resources on it. But that one particularly, when you're thinking about the traffic light paper, right. it came out last year, 2019. So it is very uh, relevant and it has all um, the therapies and interventions that have their different levels of evidence. And it's sort of easy to understand, I suppose. It goes green, which means it's got a very good level of evidence. So as Teresa was talking about, is it a randomised control trial? Does it have, you know, thousands of participants um, that have shown that this is effective? The, the yellow, which is, you know, yes, there's some stuff on it, but we, we need to learn a lot more. And then there's the red, which is sort of pretty much saying potentially, do you know what, that's something that at this time, we probably shouldn't be doing. There's evidence to show that it isn't necessarily effective or it could actually do harm. So um, that link is actually in the chat and we will also make sure that we share it um, later on as well. Uh, now, I think there's a few more questions. So um, Angela, there was a comment that you made uh, before about um, drooling. So when life was younger, um, that uh, there was potentially an issue with drooling. There's just a a mother that's written in is, is what did you do about that? Were you able to do things about that? Uh, I can't remember exactly what age um, we started giving her our, a medication called Artane. I think that may have been in either kindergarten or first grade. Um, prior to that, she wore bibs. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the drilling was um, so she started taking the Artane probably about age five, six, or seven. Dr. Gabler, maybe you can remember when. Um, I apologize, everybody, that there's some people trying to get into contact with me. But the, the question there, I suppose, is, uh, Dr. Gabler, when it comes to drooling and, and thinking about potential different interventions, obviously there are, are many medications potentially, and, but there's other things that you can do as well. Right. I think that for me, um, uh, drooling becomes a practical problem when you need to have um, a really good enunciation, or at least as helpful as you can get. And also, you don't want to have the social stigma of drooling when you're a smart kid. So um, uh, medications can be considered. 
Uh, you can, uh, if it's severe enough, there are the injectables, the neurotoxins for uh, saliva control. And then there are some speech therapy techniques that can be helpful as well. Um, in, and I think that it's so usually with all of the ideas about medication, you try the therapies and you escalate as uh, uh, you need to if you need to go to the uh, medications. There's also surgical um, re um, uh, sort of a a, um, a reroute of this of the glands as well, but uh, that's usually for just very severe cases. And this actually just brings up another question that's come through. Um, this was more for the panel, but it, it's come through asking uh, when we're looking at medications actually for spasticity, you, you just spoken about um, toxins potentially for drooling, but uh, for spasticity, how long um, should they be given? You know, is this something that can be given throughout um, somebody's life or is this sort of a one-off? Uh, I think it, it really depends on the goal of the medication. Um, I think it's always worthwhile to have a drug holiday to see if you really do need the medication um, so that uh, you have the opportunity to re-engage then uh, on the benefits. Um, I think there are some medications that are used very long term, including baclofen, um, uh, some of the other medications for, for muscle tone. Um, so it, it is, uh, again, as Teresa says, there, these are things that we don't really have a very good understanding of in terms of, of the benefit or the impact, but we do feel that uh, they do little harm long term. And the Johnson family, final comments from you. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it to you to be able to do the final comments this evening. Um, is there anything else that you would like to tell our audience? And I, I just want to say a big thank you, obviously, for taking the time this evening. You know, you are absolutely wonderful. You're, a, you're an incredible family. Lark, I can't wait to see what you actually do um, with all these different things that you have in mind for the future. But is there any sort of final thoughts that any of you have? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for allowing us to participate in this forum. Uh, we're always happy and willing to share our story with anyone and hopefully it'll be a help and encouragement to some other families. Um, I remember I think when Lark was maybe seven or eight years old and um, we just sat her down and told her that you know you have cerebral palsy and we didn't we wanted her to be okay with that that yes this is what your diagnosis is it's not a bad thing. You didn't do anything wrong. You're not a bad person. Mm -hmm. And she has moved forward in that space very confident in herself. And she will kindly tell people who look at her strangely, I have cerebral palsy. And that's just what it is. So uh, again, to just emphasize embracing what it is and making the most of it. We're in a wonderful time. We're in an information age. There's so much information mm -hmm. out there, so many different mm -hmm. things that you can look into to assist your family. But it's it's a blessing when you know what it is that you're dealing with and you can move forward addressing that challenge. Well, on that note, I just want to say thank you so much. I also want to say a huge thank you uh, to Greeny who has been signing this whole mm -hmm. time and making sure that this is accessible to everybody. Um, we are so lucky to have you on board during these town halls and just want to say a big thank you to you as well. So in wrapping up, um, I think I'd just like to say, you know, obviously we are have this is our third uh, town hall that we're having. We will be having a couple more at the start of next year that we hope that you'll be all joining us for. Um, and I just want to say, obviously, a big thank you to our community who has supported these town hall series and been really engaged and asked as many questions as you, as you have. Obviously, we will make sure that um, any of the resources that any of the panelists have spoken about, that you will have access to those and we will share them with you. Um, this will also be available on demand. You'll be able to access that on our YouTube channel as well as um, on CP Resource and through our social media channels. But um, on that note, um, again, I'd like to thank Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals um, who have supported these town halls.